I would now like to introduce our two speakers, Andrew Evans and Liz Newman. Andrew is a retired CFO from Wellesley College. He has served in the Foreign Service with USAID overseas and in Washington, DC, and later served as Associate Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He was an administrator on an administrator for Bright Grant to the UK in 1992. Liz Newman has over 30 years of experience in financial management, organizational consulting, and executive search, with an established track record of serving clients in higher education. Liz is a trusted confidant and advisor to university presidents, provosts, and boards. She is also a recently retired managing partner at Koya Leadership Partners. And now I would also like to introduce Lisa Boucher, our program manager, also a Fulbrighter ETA to Peru. Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, like Shaw said, I'm the program manager at the Fulbright Association. I'm super excited to have you guys here today and learn from our two excellent speakers. I just wanna give a few norms before we get started. We do ask that you make sure your microphones stay on mute so that we minimize background noise. Um, if you can keep your cameras off, um, this tends to help with the bandwidth. Um, and then lastly, all questions, you can type them in the chat box. We'll try to answer some as we go and then we'll mostly be doing Q&A at the end. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy and Liz. Thank you guys so much. Hi everyone, nice to have you with us today. And um, for those of you who have been a participant before, uh, just to let you know that this is session three. Uh, session one was launching the search. Session two was resume focused. Today it's uh, preparing a, a letter of interest. And the next week will be the last one in this group uh, related to pre preparation for the interview. And um, just to um, refresh our memories, uh, last week we talked a lot about um, the resume preparation, and we hope that you have been fine tuning yours. It's always good to have a look at it, uh, update it uh, from time to time, and hopefully you were able to use some of the uh, pointers that we offered last week. And um, with that, I think we should move right into the conversation around the letter of interest. And um, I'll start, Liz and I will go back and forth. Uh, and again, if you have questions, make sure that you put them uh, on the Zoom chat box. So what's the point of the cover letter? It's, we pref actually, we, we prefer to call it a letter of interest. And it's really to help the recruiter or the manager, the hiring manager, get to know you a little bit better. Uh, if you think of your resume as the outline of career, of your career and then the letter of description, uh, the letter as, a, as really a description of your career. The, um, there is much that is conveyed in the resume, but the letter of interest is something that really links to, to the job. Um, your letter of interest complements your resume in a way that allows you to elaborate on your expertise, your skills, and your strengths. And when you write a strong letter of interest, you're really showing your future employer that you're the person they're looking for. And um, if they don't ask for one, think about sending one uh, anyway. I think it's a, a very important piece of uh, communication that can actually help you uh, get an interview. Um, it does offer your future employer a deeper insight into who you are that's beyond your work history and credentials. And in most cases, the uh, employer is not looking for someone who, who is sort of one size fits all. So this is really, the letter of interest is really a way for you to demonstrate um, why you're right for this position. So Liz. Thanks, Andy. Um, again, it's so exciting to see you all here. Um, to continue on the letter of interest, it's something that I think Andy and I have focused on a lot in the work that we've done in recruiting and coaching um, our candidates. So I have always looked at this as uh, the letter of interest as answering two questions. Why me? So why does this institution want me for this particular position or to be a part of their institution? And the second question is why do I want this position at this institution? And I think if you think about how to answer those two questions in a letter of interest, it will give you 
the framework that um, to fill in some research and some information that answers those two questions. Um, I think it's important um, when you're answering the question, why do I want to be at your institution and in this role to do research beyond maybe the ad or the position description that you're responding to enough information that might add even just one or two sentences to a letter of interest that shows you've taken the initiative to learn about the institution and to express from your perspective why this is an institution that you're interested in being a part of. Um, at the same time, um, you're then filling in information about you, your experience, who you are as a person, all of that to answer the question, why does this institution want me? So um, that's, um, the, that's the key point, I think, as you're composing this letter. Um, how does a, um, a letter of interest differ from a cover letter? Um, so this, um, first, I think you have to do all the things you would do in a cover letter. You wanna put in the data that you need a company to know and, and you know, say my resume is attached. But again, I think you, you want to go beyond just your contact information. It should not just be a templated letter of interest, but shows that you've taken initiative in expressing more about the position. So you want to highlight um, your um, experiences that are most relevant. So here again, you don't just want to restate what is in your resume, but begin to ex take it to the next level of detail or um, data or information so that you're, you know, I, yes, I was here and here are the things I did here in particular or that were successful that would be appropriate for this position. Um, highlights particular strengths that the position would be interested in seeing in a person. Um, so in some ways you're connecting the dots rather than just duplicating a resume. Um, you're gonna provide additional information perhaps that isn't as obvious on a resume. And that can be any a number of things depending upon the circumstances. Um, it could be a different context for responsibilities. Um, it could be talking about your interest in moving um, or um, a context of a promotion or your willingness to participate in certain ways in projects. Um, so it's, it, the letter becomes a more creative approach to your discussing who you are and why you might be appropriate for this. Great. I think it's also uh, important to point out that um, as the reader is uh, reading your letter of interest, they also have likely uh, right beside it uh, the the position description and the qualities and the characteristics that they're looking for. So uh, you want to make it easy for the reader to uh, be able to find all those characteristics and the letter of interest helps either point that out in the resume or actually state it uh, right in the, in the letter of interest. Right. So to help that come alive, you, you want to use examples uh, that, um, that actually point to experiences that you have that relate to this particular new opportunity and how your combination of education and work and interest, your story, um, illustrates and clarifies why you might be a stronger candidate than another applicant. Using your Fulbright experience, I think is always a, a great uh, way to identify, for example, I could say my Fulbright experience visiting three international business programs in Europe gave me a better sense of our international competition and in some ways was a catalyst for developing the international business program at the Fletcher School when I worked there. So it's a link. So you're actually providing some context for the, for the reason that you did that particular activity and how that sets you up for your next uh, level of work. Um, again, using data to quantify accomplishments is persuasive. And when you link together how these accomplishments made you successful in that role, the reader gets a better sense of how you work, and that's really important. People want to hire, employers want to hire people who can identify their aspirations in the context of the mission and goals of the hiring department. And um, there's one other thing I think that's always important is if you, if the role supervises others, you want to make sure that you tell the employer 
that you've been able to motivate colleagues. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have been their formal supervisor, but um, if, it, uh, if you have been, that's great. But a way to, uh, if you can identify the way that you've been able to motivate colleagues, I think that's uh, as important as well. So um, uh, continuing on into this amazing letter of interest that we're composing <laughs> together, um, you want to acknowledge something about the company, um, the work that it does successfully, um, how this institution or this position fits into your goals. Um, and here I think is something, and it's an important point, it doesn't have to be lofty lifetime goals as much as what's what is the next thing for me? And why is this um, position helpful in me in getting to that next place um, in my career? How does it lead um, naturally to the expansion of my experience in a particular field or industry? Um, and that I, as I listen to how Andy and I are describing this, um, I think the thing you have to be very, very intentional about is customizing a letter of interest because some of the examples, and you probably have quite a few, um, will be more relevant to some positions than others. And so really thoughtfully thinking about what, what experiences or what goals do I have that meet this particular institution and this job. Um, so you, in some ways you're gonna redo it or recut and paste some of it for every position you're applying to. You may have a template that you use that covers some standard things, but just be very intentional about what you're including in a particular letter of interest for a particular position. Um, the skills that you are presenting, communication skills, problem solving skills, creative thinking skills are very valuable and desirable to employees. And the letter becomes one of the first ways for you to really demonstrate that. Um, you can highlight things on your resume, how you um, connect um, what might, might not seem logical to somebody looking at your resume, uh, some sort of experience that you see very relevant to something they're looking for, but it might not be logical. Think about how to connect that. I, I supervise this small group of people as we put a work plan together and that and how that relates to a particular opportunity that might be in the position description of the job ad. I think that's incredibly helpful making those connections for somebody in the letter and showcasing those skills. So um, we often see in some letters or in some resumes um, the gaps in work experience and use the letter of interest to explain those but make it brief. Um, you want uh, the hiring manager to be focused on your skills and not sort of left wondering what you were doing for those six months between those two jobs seven years ago or whatever. It, it's a waste of that time. So you want to make sure that the hiring manager is focused on your skills. So um, think carefully about how you want to craft that language and, and make sure that it tells a story but is brief. Um, and somebody's already asked this question. Yeah. <laughs> but, so it's a really good thing to think about the length of a letter of interest. Um, I have rarely seen, even with people with a lot of experience, a letter of interest that needs to be more than a page and a half or two pages. There are exceptions to that. Um, but it's also a good opportunity to really, even as you do with your resume, to look at how you're saying things and what you're saying and to make sure it's to the point and brief, not too wordy. Think about, I mean, I've often um, offered advice to people doing letters of interest to write the long version and then maybe take out things that you're more likely to say at an interview or have as an add-on thing to a conversation down the road and, and narrow what your, what are the real points that you wanna make to the hiring authority as you're putting this letter and resume together. So um, just, think about that as you're putting it together. It's, I mean, there's so much that you want to make sure that you talk about. And I think sometimes it's like thinking about when am I going to, when do I bring this up or how do I bring it up? But I would say one and a half to two pages. Do you think that's right, Andy? I do think that's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then the other piece really is proofread, proofread, proofread. Um, and I am a big believer in spell check and grammar check but you would be amazed at the word, how certain words spell check 
um, I was typing in my journal this morning and I was fascinated by <laughs> the words that were coming up as the words like autocorrect. So spell check and grammar check, but really read it through yourself and have somebody who hasn't spent a lot of time helping you put it together, read it really just from the point of view of proofread word for word, comma for comma, whatever it is, you know, just make sure somebody really looks at it. Um, it it's, as it says here, we have seen some really, really talented people um, just not really, you know, you see what you think you see once you've looked at a letter for a long time, not realize there's an obvious typo, even in the first paragraph. Um, and the other piece of this is if you're cutting and pasting a letter of interest to go to different places, um, sometimes you forget to change the job title or the institution or something like that. So it's really important to just make sure it's the right institution, it's the right position, and the information you've included is what you want for that particular position. Yeah. So I see there's a question here. I think I'll go ahead and answer this one. It's about how uh, not to duplicate things that are in the resume and how to highlight them in the letter of interest. So let's use an example. Um, you were teaching English in a rural school in, uh, in Malaysia, let's say, and um, you had to coordinate with three or four other teachers and that required a certain level of skill on your part to be able to work as a team, even though you weren't necessarily the leader of the team, you had to be able to coordinate and make sure that everyone was uh, in sync with what you were doing, including yourself. So the job description that you're looking at, let's say, is um, asking for someone who can work in a team. So in your letter of resume, you have that you are a teacher for this period of time, but you may not necessarily have highlighted the fact that it required you to, to interact with this other, uh, these other colleagues uh, in the school. So this is a way in the, in the letter of interest that you could point that out saying, in order to be successful in my role as a teacher, I did all the teaching activities, but I also had to work with others to make sure that we were in sync in terms of the curricula we were providing, that kind of thing. So it, it, it then, which, with what I think the letter of interest often does is provides the link between what's in the position description and what's in the resume. And it's that letter of interest that actually is going to convince the reader that, they're, that you're, you really are worth another look and that uh, you're, you're on the right step in this process for getting this job. Yeah, and what I would add is, I think what's really interesting is um, thinking about your skill set. So if let's say you're going from teaching to uh, another type of position in an industry or something like that. So somebody who's doing the reviewing of resumes or hiring isn't always thinking how teaching skills match to um, an administrative role. So I'll add this example. You may have helped develop curriculum. You may have written procedures or documents that would be totally relevant to a more administrative role in an industry. And so highlighting the things as you see what they're asking for in a position, making sure that they might understand what you take for granted almost in a role that you did that might be relevant to a particular position. It's kind of a very interesting exercise in sort of matching the skill set to your resume and then making sure how you have it on your resume and how you then want to explain it in the letter of interest becomes the sort of dance that you do. Right. Um, it, I also see, I mean, we're going to start to talk a little bit about writing samples, which is important, I think, but I, I, this is, I mean, your resume is a sample of one type of writing. It's your chronology. It's a very quick landscape of your career, where you went, what you did, how you got educated, those types of things. The letter then takes on a different style. That's yet a different way of expressing things, examples. I almost say um, the resume is sort of this technical document that shows where you've been and the letter becomes a more personal explanation. It becomes a little more your voice in a different way of what you've done and some examples of why that would be um, relevant. And um, Andy and I were talking about this. It is a writing sample. It's gonna be viewed by whoever looks at it as another document about you and who you are and how you organize and express things. So I think it really needs to be taken pretty seriously. 
Um, so um, the next thing moves on into other writing samples. So it, not a bad idea to begin to have a portfolio of creative work you've done. Keep it in a, a Google Doc or a Google Drive or file or whatever. It, it, I would probably keep it in a file on my desktop on paper just to tell you how my, the, the age of me, but you know, keep it readily available for you so you can access it and think about how you might share it or even use excerpts of it as you're preparing documents to send to a potential employer. Um, there could be different, you could have written a manual, you could have built curriculum and documented, maybe there are essays you've written, maybe you've done a blog, maybe this is an opportunity where there's a photo album you have or something that you've created that could be appropriate. Um, just I, the more that you recognize the different things you have that people might be interested in and keep it in a place where you can review it, in some ways it sparks the creativity as you're putting together these documents for potential employers. I think it's very important to really think about what it is they're looking for and then take some time to sort of reflect on that as you're taking a walk or whatever, saying, you know, I'm trying to think of what the kind of skills I've had. And then something will come to you about that's somewhat related and you want to make sure that you are able to identify that. Um, I think going back to the creative work as Liz just described, don't be, don't be in the position where you are suddenly rushed to pull all this together. Plan ahead, put it aside, make sure, it, you know, it might not be right. So for this particular job, but it could be right for another job. So have a list of a number of different things that you can, that you can pull out. I think it's really important uh, to uh, be able to do that quickly and is impressive to people that you're organized enough to be able to send their, they ask for a writing sample after they, before they want to interview you and after they've read your resume and so on, that you're able to uh, respond quickly and say, you know, here's, a, here's an example of my writing, uh, my, my best writing work. I think, um, go ahead. I was gonna answer a couple questions, so go ahead, Andy, if you. Uh, well, I was gonna get into preparing for the PowerPoint, but let's see what the questions are. Yeah, go ahead. So I, somebody's asked who to dire direct address the letter to. Um, that's a really good question. If you can't talk to somebody and ask that question, or if it isn't articulated, um, I, I don't like to whom it may concern, to tell no. you the truth, but maybe, no. um, to the hiring authority or right. something like that. Um, I, if you can find out from someone how to address it, I think that's the most important thing. I, I mean, I'm trying to think if there's a generic, everything generic I'm, I'm thinking of right now doesn't resonate with me. So this goes back to the, if you can find out as much as you possibly can about their hiring process. Yep. Because if there's going to be a committee, you could say, dear search committee for the position of X, Y, Z or something like that. It sounds a little more personal. To whom it makes concern is not, is, does not get received well, we can tell you that. So right. it seems like you haven't become invested in this particular institution right. the way someone who is there now uh, is. And so I think you want to make sure that you go that extra right. uh, mile. Right. So, this, this comes a little later, and we might talk about it again in, in the next webinar, but um, an employer may ask you to prepare a presentation, often in, in the form of a PowerPoint presentation, on a topic they assign you. Uh, this is assuming that you uh, make it to the next step in this process and are asked for an interview. So you don't want to be in the position of learning or uh, updating your skills on PowerPoint at the last minute. So familiarize yourself so that if you then learn the content, you can pull together the content, but you're not spending half the time on the, on the um, actual logistics of trying to make it fit into the various PowerPoint uh, process. So spend some time uh, understanding uh, what it is you might talk about if it's very open. Think a little bit more about what this particular industry is, uh, what this particular department is responsible for, what they are perhaps looking for, some of the challenges, maybe you've read some other stuff that relates to that. So begin to think about overall, if they were to ask you, what do you think about this, that you'd, you'd have anyway some content uh, in your mind already to start the, that PowerPoint presentation. All right, uh, we covered in the earlier webinar, again, getting to know the process, and we just want to make sure that uh, we don't 
we want to overemphasize that because it's really, really important so that you become aware. And then uh, be aware that each process or the processes across all these uh, opportunities are not the same. So you have to adapt accordingly. Um, snail mail, which is not extinct, uh, <laughs> may be the way to apply. Uh, email, text with a link, or an online applicant tracking system uh, are all possibilities. And I think you, you have to uh, be ready to, to go in any direction that they, they suggest, obviously. Um, it often depends on the size of the institution, whether they have a full HR operation or whether they have uh, the, the, uh, an online tracking system at all. So um, you have to adapt. Right. And, and I would say if the, if the first step is, um, I think I'm off a screen, sorry. Um, if the first step in applying is an applicant tracking system, so it's fairly automated, I think what you want to try and do is get a sense of what the everything they're going to ask you for or, or sort of read through what, what, how it's being presented to you so that you can take advantage of um, answering the questions either by cutting and pasting from your resume or maybe pieces of a letter of interest in ways that um, fully answer the question and and I guess in some ways what I would say is you want to make sure that everything that's on that resume or in the letter of interest that you want conveyed um, you get into those various questions I think you can in most instances go back and forth on your answers like I don't I think you can fill it all in before you have to submit it um, but again looking what the responsibilities are and how you get those into the various questions or submittals um, they're asking. Um, some of it can come from your resume. Um, look at the style and space available. Again, how you proofread it for punctuation and things like that is going to be really important. Um, the other thing we've talked about a little bit is um, how you see what you have um, may look beautiful. Um, it could be in a PDF, it could be in a Word document. Um, there are all different ways to have this information portrayed and for you it may look great. Once you send it, um, who it, the person or the institution receiving it may have different software or different print capabilities. It's interesting, I have an iPad and a laptop at home and depending upon which one of those I print the PowerPoint we're using, it looks completely different. And in some cases it mashes the bullets together. So I'm not sure how you prevent that, but I would be aware of it even in how you, how you send things. Make sure that it looks as good as it can possibly look. Um, one of the things we thought about as we were talking this through, because I think sometimes if you're in an applicant tracking system, um, they don't always specifically ask for a letter of interest or a cover letter. So it occurred to us that you could in fact embed in one PDF document a letter of interest and a resume. And that would give both of those, um, I mean, they would receive both, all of that information. Um, I think that's what I might consider doing, especially if you thought the letter of interest was compelling to the case you were making for a particular position. Did I cover most of that? And then we talked about, some people have asked us about two column resumes. Um, I suspect um, we kind of think the more traditional you are because of how things are uploaded or shared, um, the better it may be. If you're comfortable that you think the style that you've put together is gonna come through well, then go ahead and do it. But you might wanna check it out, a couple different printers or asking different people to print it out just to see what it looks like. Because you want it, you want to make sure that whatever you send is easily read, easily uploaded, not too dense, all of those things, not full of pictures and things like that. Right. So we have a number of questions, but I think we'll hold them till we go through this last slide and then circle back if we could. The um, so we're on uh, the next page, right? This is right. Okay. So um, as we discussed previously. Uh, we recommend that you include both in the resume and in the letter of interest contact information. Uh, so your email, not the one that you use for business, but the one that's your personal email, um, your personal phone number, not your office phone number, 
and the link to your LinkedIn page. And um, it may be, we talked about this before, it may be important to the recruiter to know some basic geographic information like, do you live in Washington, DC? Do you live in Boston? Do you live outside or near a, a large metropolitan area? That will be important to them if they're either wanting to recruit nationally or whether they're limited in their funding and can only recruit regionally. So you, you need to be able, I think, to, to at least say, I'm, uh, I have it on your resume and in your letter of interest that I'm living in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, people would understand that. Um, again, it may be important for people to see that you are familiar with the area because that particular job may require a network and to have you already uh, in a community that might touch on that network, I think would be very attractive. So um, again, think about, you just have to think about that a little bit about whether the recruiter might want to know basic geographic information. And what I'll add to that, because I think the next bullet covers that as well, Andy. Yeah. Um, I, so here's the thing I think you have to be very careful about. Um, you don't want to leave the hiring authority with the impression that you just really want to move to this geographic area period, end of discussion. Like if you lead with, um, I, you know, I'm going to go to a graduate program here and I want to get there. So, so then they think, well, they just want to get here. The job's not as important. So you have to balance your, your willingness to move geographically with your real interest in the position. Um, and it's, you'd be surprised the number of people who just say, yeah, I, I, you know, my wife just got a job in Atlanta, I want to be there. And that sends, I mean, that's a questionable message to a hiring authority. Yes, it's nice to know that you're going to be in that geographic area, but, but are you just looking at anything at this point and not in particular this position? So you have to balance that combination, I think. And um, finally, uh, question about personal hobbies and outside interests or information about outside interests. Um, if it rounds out your candidacy, great, include it, uh, especially if it might trigger some sort of additional conversation or point of interest or identify some connection, that would all be great. Um, but if, it, if mentioning the hobby does really nothing to uh, amplify for the reader why you have relevance to this role, then probably best to leave it out. People are interested in your outside activities, but only as they really relate to the particular job at this point. So let's turn to some of these questions. Um, I'll take the first one here, Liz. This one relates to um, uh, studied. Um, if what you studied as an undergrad major does not line up with the job or industry you are pursuing, should that be explained in the letter of interest? I think it's more important to say how you got that into that particular industry or job, why it was attractive to you and what you've learned in that position. It doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't use um, what you majored in in college. Hopefully it was not just the, the study of, uh, of biochemistry, but that it was all of the related courses around biochemistry that also prepared you had a science background in that science is relevant to this particular job. So talk that through a little bit. And um, I, I think it's better to put it in base, uh, sort of very simply in a letter of interest if you can. And then if you get an interview, you would amplify that and talk about that more. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, I have sort of felt that um, my experience over the years is that education is always relevant at some level. So it may not like, maybe you're applying for an IT job and you're an English major, I, just as an extreme example, um, being able to write or problem solve or parse is really important. So if you're not, I agree with Andy, I think if you can make the connection, it's great. And I generally assume that education is relevant somehow. To, you've taken the time to become educated and successfully graduated at some level. And I think that's just in of itself important. Right. Um, the next question relates to writing samples. So for writing samples, should the topic be relevant to the job or field? Well, ideally, yes. But if it 
if the writing uh, is a really strong piece of, of uh, documentation that shows you have the kinds of skills that they're looking for, I don't think that the area of, of interest or topic that it's focused on is as important. So I would say pick the pieces of writing that are the, mo that are the strongest and use those. Liz, I don't know whether you agree with that or not. Yeah, but. no, I totally agree with it. And then I think it's the context. So if they're asking for a PowerPoint or a blog type, um, you know, if they're asking for a, a style or piece of writing in a particular format, then it's probably less important the content than how you approach writing a blog or how you put together a PowerPoint. Those are the, I think that's just as important. Right. Um, the um, next one ahead. is about um, regarding the portfolio. I have publications and articles. I'm sorry, I missed one. We'll come back to that. Um, I have publications and articles published and not published. Should the portfolio contain the full articles or only portions? That's a great question. Um, I think it depends on the job that you're applying to. The, the listing of the, if there's a link, if it's published, uh, and there's a link that you can provide that might provide a summary of the article, that would be great. Um, but if it is not published and it does uh, read well and it's informative and it shows your talent in being able to write a, kind of a piece of research-based uh, article, then I would definitely include it as, as part of your writing sample and not necessarily the whole article. So the question you slip by is um, linking somebody to your website for writing samples. I think that's the one. Um, yeah. I, I'm a little bit cautious about that. Um, I guess um, if it's well organized and, and in a format that's easy for someone to, un, to get through your writing samples, I think it's probably a great idea actually. Um, and I would want to make sure that you were either pointing them to the relevant samples, um, if that makes sense. So I guess if, if it's, again, it depends upon what the website looks like, I think, and how it's organized and how easy it would be for someone to, to skim through it or read through it. Um, I think the thing you do have to remember, given the, where we are right now, lots of people are applying for jobs. And so there's lots of information for people to look at. And I think that, again, here is where this very clear letter of interest resume um, and maybe listing of articles is key. And it may be that that website is, is referred to later at an interview versus in the letter of interest, depending upon the timing and the amount of information. I don't know, Andy, if you wanna to add to that. No, I think that's right. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that you've, you've pointed out exactly what's, what's right on that. Um, I'm going back to this other question here, which is about uh, moving and relocating. And mm -hmm. I think that I would, I would answer this, that question this way. Um, if you were to say that uh, it, is also of, it is also in my interest to be located in Boston where I have family because X, Y, Z, it's a center of great learning and blah, blah, blah. Um, it becomes not as it's relevant because again, the, the reader will assume, well, you have you know, family in the area, that's why you wanna be in this particular area, but it's not as important. That's not the reason you're moving there. You're really moving for this particular job. And they will then be happy that you would be able to, to uh, be settled in pretty quickly, I think, in terms somebody, of- that. Somebody asked this, it should be half and half. So I think yeah. um, noting your ability to relocate is a sentence. Right. Um, it's right. a check off a box. So they, they're not living in Boston now and they're willing to be here. Great. I now know that. Yeah. The rest, the more important thing to me is, I would say, if I was looking at a letter of interest and resume, what are the qualifications you have for the job? I, so I would spend more time on that than relocating. Yeah. Um, there's another question here about grouping paragraphs based on skills for position. I really like that. Um, it makes it easier for the reader. So if they're talking about your ability to look at complicated data and uh, analyze it in a way that does X, Y, Z, um, talk about that experience, point to it in your resume and say how you think that's particularly relevant and then go on to the next bullet uh, in the position description. So sometimes I actually look to see in reading a resume and reading a letter of interest and I have to put sort of check marks next to the, to the individual skills and qualifications that they're looking for 
And then, you know, it looks like the person has all those skills. From that then, it's whether we wanna hire that particular person. So um, I think that's a good question to ask. And I would also consider starting the letter um, not only with just expressing your interest, but your understanding of the company, like something that's so, you know, it's kind of like patting somebody on the back in the beginning. Um, so more than just repeating what is the descriptor of a company in a position description or an ad, but something that shows that you are, you know, you've done your research on this company, you're interested, and then begin to talk about yourself. Right. This is, a, this is a very obvious thing. I'm gonna go back to the proofread again because Liz and I have both read resumes over the years where uh, you're looking for a position at George Washington University and you open it up and say, George Washington University is a great institution located in downtown Boston or downtown Washington DC, sorry. And I'm so happy to be there and blah, blah, blah. And you go on and do all the things perfectly in the letter of interest. And then in the last paragraph, you say, I really hope that uh, American University will hire me. I mean, yeah. it's obviously you've used a template yeah. from another job. And uh, whenever we've gone back to a candidate and exposed to that, they are enormously embarrassed. So um, please proofread, it's really important. Yep. Any other questions? Or comments, any thoughts about what you've been experiencing? Yeah, even? that would be good too. I mean, I can imagine it's just a very interesting world to be exploring jobs, school, volunteer work, all of that, just really? a lot going on. Yeah. Okay, then um, we'll look forward to, uh, hold on a second. Yep. Um, a I, Lisa, you know, I think you have ways for them to access previous presentations, right? Uh, and what's a good closing paragraph? Don't just say hire me. No. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's a really interesting um, question. I was helping somebody this week um, who's moving and looking. And um, in some ways, it may be, it, it's sort of thank you for considering me. Maybe it's something else about the company. Um, you know, it, it, I have no problems with looking forward to hearing from you or whatever that type of thing is, but it's sort of a, I, I don't know, I, it, it may vary depending upon how much you know about a company, but I think it's, it, it's not the place to put, oh, and by the way, here's something else you need to know about me. I wouldn't think about that. It's more like closing out with um, your interest in the opportunity. That's how I think about it, Andy. I don't know if that's yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think there's something that it's like in an, as you take your leave from someone you've been talking to that you uh, appreciate uh, having met them and you look forward to further conversation, something as simple as that. And uh, right. I think it leaves it on a positive note, which is, which is great. Right. Someone asked here about bolding stuff uh, in, uh. The, in the various, uh, the, so yes, be careful. Uh, is what I would say. Don't make it too artsy or creative. It's better to keep it straightforward. I think is the, in some cases, I've seen people where they react badly to sort of the, the, the bolding and the complicated ah. structure. I think it's probably better to not do that. But um, if there's a really good reason why it's bolded, then do it. But I, I think probably I'm, I'm more inclined to be traditional in that sense. Only because We've seen reactions and when it's too, too much, uh, people, search committees in particular, don't react well. So um, you're also asking about bullet points. I think I'm assuming since we're talking about letters of interest, you're talking about bullet points in the letter of interest. And I'm fine with that. I, here's the one concern I have. I do think a letter is about more complete sentences and if it's just repeating bullet points that are in your resume. The goal would be to add context to those experiences in a complete sentence format is how I would think about it. Right, I agree with that. Um, when you're not young. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about not being young. What does this say um, here, hold on. And would like to change jobs for a new experience and new knowledge. What is the best to do, please? Um, 
I, lo I love that actually, because people do make career changes. Um, so I guess um, I would take a lot of the information we've talked about in a letter of interest and a resume and think about how you would make the case for one, why you're making this career change, but also what you would bring to that would be of value. So um, I'll use a very simple example. I think I used it early on since most of my work was in higher education. Um, I was always very intrigued with people who had not spent most of their lives in higher education and what they would bring to higher education. Um, and the people who were the most successful at making that transition, it may have been a similar, it might have been finance to finance, but it might have been for profit to not for profit, were very different types of institutions. Their ability to describe themselves as a leader and to really have thought carefully through what the differences would be moving from one opportunity to another that was quite different, those are the people that were successful in making those transitions. That's one example I can think of, Andy. The other one I can think of is a person that we recruited from uh, a long um, number of years in the government, and he was actually working in the uh, Department of State. And for many years, he had been thinking about wanting to work in higher education. And so we began that conversation by saying, why do you want to work in higher education? And he had very compelling answers, and he had uh, really strong experience in the sense that He'd worked with people on the Hill, he'd worked with people in the White House, he'd worked on a number of different constituencies, all of which are very relevant to the kind of work that he would have to do in this particular role in um, this college. And um, he, he the, on the part of the college, the people that were recruiting, they said, um, we would really like to have someone who has lots of higher education experience. So um, this person convinced them that the, his experience had the right kind of skills that were relevant and transitional, or that could be transitioned to this particular new role. He got the job and uh, actually uh, two years later when the president left, he was the interim president for a year. So he was very successful. Yeah, I, I also think you, you probably have a leadership style or skill set if you're, that is important to project as you um, are more mature in your job. Um, experience and I think that's something very important. I mean it often is why you do want to change careers or positions. So being able to articulate that in a way that's comfortable and um, and thorough and thoughtful I think is important as well. Um, this question, I, uh, I'm building a project requiring me to ask strangers for financial support and seed money. Any thoughts on writing a letter of interest style introductory letter in this context? It's a great question. <laughs> I think it's the basics of writing a compelling persuasive letter. It doesn't matter whether it's a letter of interest, but really is more basic to you have this goal. It's really important to you, why it's important to you and uh, why you think it should be of importance to this person you're writing to. Right. So uh, the next one, I love the term painting a picture because it often is what I talk about in a letter of interest. So your resume is the chronological picture of your career and a letter is, is really painting a picture. I think you have to be careful about being succinct about um, what you want to say and covered. Um, and I, but I will say this, it, for it to be in your style and voice is also important. So it can feel stilted if it's not coming from you at some level, I think. So it's, it's sort of the balance of um, being clear and succinct about what the reader needs to learn about you and having it in a voice that feels good to you. Yeah. I think the only thing I would add to that particular answer, Liz, is that, um, for some people reading that, it's a, it's a task to go through a number of resumes. They may have a hundred resumes to look at. And um, it's a balance between your painting a picture that is creative might trigger something in them that they'll, they really like, 
or it'd say, I don't have time to read, you know, think of yourself as a tree and so on and so forth. If, if it's too creative, that's not going to work. Uh, but if, if it does really get a hook, there's a real hook and it's not too long, then, then it's worth a try, I think. So I would this, suggest you write it and then step back and then yeah. ask someone else to yeah. read it, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. yeah. So advice for candidates trying to change field or industry. Um, I think you have to focus both on transferable skills and the motivation for changing fields. I think they're both important, actually. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I would, what I would think about is um, if it was possible to talk to somebody about some of that. I mean, so Andy was talking about um, someone who was coming out of federal government into higher education. I will say higher education is very, very conservative about bringing people in from outside of higher education. And so the motivation, both transferable skills and motivation are critical for people to hear as they're talking to candidates making that transition. And I think it's probably true in most industries. Um, I mean, you know, there must be a motivation for you doing it. I'm assuming you've answered both of those questions in your mind somehow. What are the transferable skills and why do I want to change fields? So being able to express it to a future employer, I think, is key. Right. I really think so. Okay. Well, thank you all for all your questions. We really appreciate that. And if anything occurs to you between now and next week uh, or this evening, whatever, um, you have our contact information on the next page, and we're very happy to uh, answer any questions you have offline.